Hello, my name is Sauce or Elise, and today I want to talk about one of my favorite aspects of hiking the Continental Divide Trail, the alternates. The CDT is often described as sort of a choose-your-own-adventure trail because there are so many different routes you can take when traveling by foot along the divide. Part of the reason there's so many options on the CDT on like the AT or the PCT is that it's a lot newer of a trail and therefore less established. The CDT is currently only about 70% complete as of the recording of this video. That means the CDTC is still working to complete the trail by purchasing land in the corridor, getting easements from private property owners, etc. So the trail changes a little bit every year and there's also some sections that truly are just unfinished, which sometimes looks like paved roadwalks or just roadwalks through rural areas. This also leaves a little bit of room for creativity. There is so much to see along the divide, um, not just on the official CDT route, and that's one of my favorite aspects of this trail. I've also found that there's less of a purity culture on the CDT, which you might encounter on other trails, um, and this also just encourages and leaves room for more adventure. Quick aside before I dive in, if you enjoyed my CDT content, please subscribe. I'll be posting more videos this summer of hikes that I'm doing, um, and I really appreciate the support and everyone that has followed along so far. Now let's talk a little bit about how to find and navigate the alternates on the CDT. A lot of thru-hikers these days use Far Out, formerly known as Gut Hook, and they have a few of the CDT alternates right on the map set that's in the app, um, and those are pretty easy to use for navigation, especially if you're already familiar with the app. Um, it's all pretty straightforward, and a lot of times there's comments about the alt itself, what you can expect on it. One quick tip for the alts on Far Out, if you're wanting to see the elevation gain of the alt, you just have to create a route and then look at the elevation that way rather than trying to view it um, in the regular view, otherwise that'll just default to the official route or what we call in Far Out the red line. Another quick watch out for using the app, I found a few instances where the mileage that's written in the description of the alt is different from the actual mileage when you do the math from point to point. So I would just recommend double checking that math if you're trying to figure out the mileage difference between the official route and the alternate route. In addition to the alts that are available on Far Out, I definitely recommend downloading the free Avenza app and downloading Jonathan Lay's map sets. You can also print Jonathan Lay's maps if you prefer paper maps. You can donate to Jonathan for the use of his maps and I will put that information in the description of this video. One of my biggest regrets on the CDT is actually not checking out more of the Jonathan Lay alts um, because the ones I did, I definitely really enjoyed. And there's also usually comments on Far Out where the two routes diverge um, and you can kind of get a sense for if people have enjoyed the alt or not via those comments if you care about other people's opinions. If not, just go see for yourself. Lastly, if you're comfortable with creating your own routes, you can always do that as well. Um, I knew a lot of people on the CDT this year that did that on occasion. They saw something cool, wanted to go see it, and they just did. Some of the most appealing DIY routes that I heard about but didn't take the time for are adding on the Tetons after the Wind River Range and also doing the Wind River High Route through the Wind River Range and finally the Fifner Traverse in the Rockies. Some of those are going to be a little bit of a logistical challenge and a timing challenge but if you're ahead of schedule and have the energy to try them, um, I wanted to mention them. All that said, here are my favorite alternates that I did take on the CDT and what I thought about each of them and what you can expect from each of them. First up is the Gila River Alternate. I feel like if you've heard of the CDT, you've probably heard of the Gila and there's a good reason for that. It's about 105.5 miles long and it's 75.5 miles shorter than the official CDT route. While these top five aren't necessarily in order, if I did have to pick a number one, it might be the Gila. It's unlike anywhere I've really backpacked before and it is just so, so beautiful. You will be crossing the river a ton of times. I think I counted almost 50 times in just one 13 mile stretch. So beware of that if you don't like soggy shoes, the high route, or the official CDT might be for you. But in my opinion, the river crossings were totally worth it. I did get little tiny cuts from my legs drying out, I think, um, but even then, totally worth it. It's also a nice change of pace from all the really long water carries in New Mexico. Obviously the water in the Gila is abundant. 
My particular flavor of this alternate was a little bit different from what's in Far Out because I also added in the Gila Cliff Dwellings, um, so I'll explain how I did that without adding miles and keeping a continuous footpath. The Gila Cliff Dwellings are absolutely worth the stop, by the way. Once you're on the Gila Alternate as defined by Far Out, you can take the road from Doc Campbell's to the Cliff Dwellings. That part is pretty straightforward. Um, and from there, you'll get to a sort of camp area slash trailhead. If you don't feel like walking all the way to the Cliff Dwellings, technically you can keep your continuous footpath if you hitch from this little trailhead. Um, the car Far Out comments may get pretty obvious, but that's about three quarters of a mile to the Cliff Dwellings themselves. And then the Cliff Dwellings are about a one mile loop and then that three quarters of a mile back to that trailhead where you'll pick up your footpath again and continue on the Gila High Route. From the Gila High Route, you'll take the Little Bear Canyon alternate, um, which I believe is a blue line, back down to the pink line, which is the Gila Alt. This detour was totally worth it to me. The Gila Cliff Dwellings were incredible, and that Little Bear Canyon section was a surprise, really um, just incredible section of trail. If those directions sounded confusing, don't worry. It's pretty straightforward. It'll make a lot more sense when you get there. My next favorite alternate is also an alternate within an alternate. It is the Narrows Rim Trail, which is on the Cibola alternate, which is the brown line in Far Out. This alt to the alt is about four miles long and it's similar in length to the alt itself, which is the brown line. This is a combo of a Far Out alt and a Jonathan layout, just to be clear. On your way into Nobo or out of Sobo, Grants, you will likely notice the Cibola alternate, which is the brown line, like I said, on Far Out. The Cibola alternate itself, and I'm sorry if I'm butchering that pronunciation, is nothing special. It's actually a roadblock for a lot of it, but it is a lot shorter than the official CDT route or the red line. It also avoids some lava rock walking if your feet are feeling particularly peed up, as mine definitely were. Kid and I were pretty burnt out at this point, and so we just wanted to get to town as fast as possible, and therefore opted for the brown line. Um, and while we were on it, we were getting pretty sick of the paved roadblock. That's when I noticed there was a lay all at northbound mile 18.8 that would get you off of the road for a while and seemed pretty cool based on the comments. Well, definitely didn't disappoint. It got us off the road, and the views from the top were pretty amazing. You could see the lava fields for miles and miles, and the red rock we were walking on was just really cool. We even saw some lizards. Um, I was really grateful that we took this alt. When you get to Lava Antenna Arch, the descent is a little bit tricky, but nothing that an experienced hiker can't handle. You're gonna just follow essentially what looks like a rock fall down a gully, and there are quite a bit of cairns to mark the way in case you feel like you're getting lost. I didn't actually have the lay maps, so we didn't really have a specific GPS or anything to follow, and we were able to navigate it just fine. When you're done with the descent, you'll pop out at the Lava Antenna Arch lookout area. It was kind of weird. We popped out on the other side behind the railings. There might be a different way, but that's where we ended up. And um, from there, you just rejoin the brown line. It's pretty straightforward. Added a nice little flare to an otherwise pretty dull section of trail. Next up is Cirque of the Towers, another absolutely incredible alternate on the CDT. The Cirque of the Towers all is about 21.4 miles long and about one mile shorter than the official route. Um, and it potentially avoids some blowdowns, but there were definitely still blowdowns on the alt as well when we went through, so take that with a grain of salt. The Cirque of the Towers in the Wind River Range is an absolute must-see for any backpacker, in my opinion. Um, I've done this section twice because it's just that good, and I'm planning to go back again. So if that says anything about it, it is pretty freaking incredible. First up, going north, you're going to have Temple Pass, which is absolutely gorgeous. Um, it's not super technical, but it is pretty rocky. You might have to do some route finding on the south side, um, but just on the other side is a beautiful, incredible view. Um, really all of it is gorgeous. And we camped on the other side of it, on the north side, and we knew that there might be a lot of crowds at Big Sandy Lake, so we wanted to stop a little bit before then, and it was absolutely stunning. One of my favorite campsites on the entire CDT. The next day, you'll hit Lonesome Lake after going over Jackass Pass, and that is absolutely gorgeous as well. One thing to note there, um, you have to camp at least a quarter mile from Lonesome Lake, so keep that in mind if you are planning to camp in any of those areas. Um, I believe you actually have to camp a quarter mile from any water in or any lake in the Wind River Range. 
Kit and I did take the climbers route over Jackass Pass to kind of change things up from the last time we were there and it was a lot of fun. It definitely provided a new challenge um, but it did take a little bit longer than Jackass Pass would on its own. That's pretty straightforward just kind of your typical high alpine pass whereas the climbers route was bouldering. Um, not necessarily anything more than class three but it was big boulders and you had to kind of navigate your way through them so if you're going to do that definitely allow yourself some extra time texas pass is steep um, and very loose rock on the north side so just keep that in mind if you get caught in the rain like i did although i will say i didn't feel as exposed as i thought i might on the top thanks to the peaks that are right next to it um, i feel like it could have been a lot scarier being in lightning and basically any other pass and it wasn't too terrible next up Still in the Wind River range, we have Knapsack Call. This all is 13.8 miles long and it's similar in length to the official CDT route. Doing this alternate is honestly what solidified my decision to attempt the Wind River High Route this summer. It is absolutely stunning, the perfect amount of challenging and gorgeous and rewarding. I absolutely recommend doing this all if you have the time. Due to the nature of the route finding and some of the scrambling, it will take you longer than your typical hiking time, so just definitely keep that in mind if you're thinking about doing this alt. When we did this alt, we camped at Tacoma Lakes, which was another one of my favorite campsites on the entire CDT. There's also some fantastic alpine dip opportunities along this alt. There's a few spots once you get into the Tacoma Lakes area where people have built windbreaks, um, but there's not a ton and you again have to be a quarter mile from the water. So just make sure you get there with plenty of time to find a good camping spot, unless you're doing the entire all in one day. But if you can time it where you can camp at Tacoma Lakes, I definitely recommend it. It wasn't super crowded back there past the last lake, um, but there were horrendous mosquitoes. So. Keep that in mind, but I kind of knew that's what I signed up for in the Wind River Range in July. After the last lake is when the true route finding begins, and I recommend skirting the remnants of Twin Glacier so that you can get a peek at some potential glacial caves. Once you're past that, it gets pretty straightforward. You can see the call and kind of determine which route would be the easiest for you. Kid and I opted to climb up the rocks on Looker's right in order to avoid climbing on the snow on the left and that proved to be an effective way for us to get up the call. It is like class 2 slash 3 scrambling so just to keep that in mind if you're planning to do this route it is a little bit um, more intense than obviously your typical hiking. It was absolutely gorgeous at the top and the whole way up. Um, one of my favorite views I've ever gotten in my life. The descent on the other side was loose and steep, but as far as route finding goes, I found it to be pretty straightforward. Eventually you end up back on the grass and you'll pick up the trail pretty quickly from there. The pass there is Cube Rock Pass. One thing to note about Cube Rock Pass is there can be some steep snow shoots um, pretty late into the season. So be ready to take your time on those as well and potentially have micro spikes depending on what time of year it is. The navigation I think can also be a little tricky through there for some people. Um, there's a big boulder field. Both times I've done it, I've been able to find follow cairns and get through it relatively quickly, but I think if you get off track, it can be pretty hard to figure out where to go next. So overall, just be sure to budget your time wisely for this all, but I cannot recommend it enough. Finally, we have the Anaconda Cutoff. This all is 52.7 miles long and it's 85.2 miles shorter than the official CDT, so it's a significant shortcut if you're needing it or if that's just your thing. This all comes recommended for me for a lot of reasons, but my top three are one, the views at Goat Flats and Storm Lake Pass, two, the town of Anaconda itself, and three, being 85 miles shorter for Nobos who need to save time and don't necessarily want to take something more significant like the Big Sky Cutoff, and also for Sobos who maybe started a little late and want to make sure that they're able to get through Colorado in time. Despite having a full on poop emergency and incoming scary clouds when I was in this area, um, Goat Flats and Storm Lake Pass were one of the huge highlights of this alternate and honestly one of the prettiest sections I thought in Montana. Anaconda itself is super awesome and hiker friendly. You also walk right through the town so you don't necessarily have to hitch if you don't want to, um, but that is one thing to note. Part of this is a road walk. Pintler's Portal is also one of the nicest hostels I've ever stayed at on a trail and that's in Anaconda so so honestly worth a stop in and of itself. It has basically everything you can need as a hiker. Personally Ken and I were feeling a little bit burnt out at this point and we needed something to boost morale and there's nothing like a good shortcut to make you feel a little bit better about the 
amount of miles you still have left to hike. Those were my top five alternates on the CDT, um, but I am going to wrap things up with a few honorable mentions. There are tons of 14ers near the trail in Colorado, which makes for some fun bonus miles and side trips when you're walking the CDT in the state. In most cases, being on the CDT actually cuts off a lot of the approach you might have to do if you were ever to come back for that 14er later. Um, so for me, as someone who lives in Colorado and is interested in checking off 14ers, um, doing them as side trips on the CDT was very appealing. For example, I climbed San Luis Peak in the San Juans, and it's less than a mile off of the CDT, but it's over a 10 mile round trip, typically. I also climbed Tori's Peak, which shares a saddle with Gray's Peak, which is already the CDT high point. So you're gonna go over Gray's, and Tori's is less than, I think, half a mile and 500 feet of gain away. It's just too close of an opportunity to pass up summoning Tories, in my opinion. Finally, I climbed Mount Massive, which is an excellent three mile side trip, in my opinion. Um, Mount Albert is nearby as well, but I had already climbed it, hence I skipped it on the CDT. Mount Albert is actually the highest mountain in Colorado, so it's a nice, fun little side trip on the CDT. There are an endless amount of alternates on the CDT, many of which are fantastic and probably just didn't make this list either because I didn't have time to take them or because I didn't want to make this obnoxiously long. Um, if you have recommendations of your own, please leave them in the comments. I'd love to hear different alts that people have taken and enjoyed um, and maybe we can crowdsource some good info for future through hikers. Thanks so much for watching and have fun out there.